This show is on host hotels, ticker HST, and it's really dedicated to PT, who posted on my YouTube about five days ago that he would love to get an update on earnings. And some of you guys uh, do follow my Twitter, but I posted some things there on host as well. Um, I actually really like this company, but this was a very strange earnings call. I do want to show it to you. Um, I am long this company. Past performance, not indicative of future returns. They make us say that. I am absolutely long this um, a couple of different ways. I'm long the stock and then I have call options either in December or January of this year because um, I knew that I kind of didn't want to be in this front of the year mess because there's just way too much weird stuff going on um, geopolitically and even domestically. We've got a ton of politics that's happening that I don't like. But host, let me give you a little background if you know nothing about host hotels. Host hotels was spun out of host Marriott, um, I think 1993. And then for a while, what it did was um, continue to change its asset structure. So there was this desire among all the hotels that took them almost a decade to do from the mid 90s through to the beginning of this, um, this century. Um, to basically go what they call asset light. So the companies Hilton and Marriott that you know as tickers, HLT and MAR, they don't have nearly as many hotels as you you think they do. They do still own a couple of hotels for both of them, um, but mostly they franchise that business out and they're just getting franchising fees and different people that own the hotels then um, are the ones that are burdened with the day-to-day -day of cleaning, et cetera. Hilton and Marriott primarily are... Uh, managing the reward system, advertising, the network stuff, etc. Okay, um, host. However, uh, ticker HST originally was just the Marriott brand hotels, but subsequently they've bought literally everything. Um, so they're not. So that's why they changed the name to Host Hotels from Host Marriott, which it was called for ages. But sometimes because old habits are hard to break, I'll call it Host uh, Marriott. So I'll do ahead and apologize in advance for that. But um, they basically decided over the course of years to only own the most luxe hotels of all time. And um, I, you know, in general, I have been following this off and on over the last decades or so, to be honest, since I probably started looking at stocks seriously in the last 20, like circa 2000 or something like that. So I've, I've revisited this stock many times over the years. The first thing I'm going to do is actually show you the portfolio that they have very briefly and where you can get to that. Because I think sometimes having a vision of what these companies do makes it super easy. Thanks, Hadouken. You know what? I'm going to keep the comments out because Hadouken's always trying to help me out uh, with a little bit of facts on the right so I don't have to stress so much about memorizing everything. Um, such a sweetheart. But yeah, they have 80 upscale hotels, 46,000 rooms in the US, Brazil, and Canada. That's where they're primarily located. They're not actually located that much in Europe or in Asia, even though from time to time they get asked those questions. But I want to show you just so you can get um, a really good sense for what kind of hotels we're talking about. If you just go to their website and you go to our portfolio, you can see what they are. And it's all the wealthy places that you want to bring your um, wife on a special occasion, your girlfriend on a special occasion. Hopefully you don't have both. I don't need to know that in the comments if you do, but you know, um, no judgment. You know, that's about, ah, okay. So they just actually four seasons resort and residence at Jackson Hole. And just to give you a sense for it, that hotel currently got a thousand dollars a night on a, if you're lucky, so to speak. So these are not cheap hotel rooms. They are definitely on the higher end of Lux uh, as far as hotels go. And so I was, and I have some old videos where I was very bullish about them because when they bought that hotel, they really bought it on the cheap um, because basically what's happened is they are one of the last man standing type of hotel REITs. They actually have an amazing set of financials such that they can do all cash deals. And if you think about it, there's a bunch of hotels that are really great, but suffered dramatically during COVID. And so they just don't have capital right now and are going to have to sell out partner or otherwise. And they are basically cherry picking. And because they can do all cash deals, they, um, they, um, 
they, you know, because they can do all cash deals, it's like amazing for them as relates to um, as relates to what kind of new properties they can get on uh, the balance sheet. OK, super cool. Let's go into the financials uh, a bit here. And um, I love that some of you guys are posting additional information for people that are just following along. I can't believe that I have such awesome people that are a part of uh, watching my show. But here is the financials for host hotels. Revenue up 20. 26% operating income up 124% EPS down 53%. I just want to make sure that you guys know this. If you ever have someone that is talking about REITs and focuses on EPS, that's the wrong metric. You need to like not necessarily listen to the for REIT information. And the reason it's the wrong metric is because for specifically um, REITs and for any real estate related company, the logic is this their job is twofold. It's to actually generate earnings from the properties themselves by renting them out. If it's an office REIT, they're renting out offices. If it's apartment REIT, they're renting out apartments. But additionally, it's to buy and sell properties. That's what the um, that's what they mean by cap rates. Cap, it, it's, it's Some of it is coming from the purchase and sale of properties. And when they go to do that activity, it affects uh, depreciation amortization that you might need to go ahead and apply right away a particular way. It affects interest in a particular way uh, because they might have to pay off the entirety of whatever debt remains. It has all of these weird things. So we do not look at EPS if you are doing the REITs. If you literally, if anyone gives you EPS, you probably just need to keep in the back of your head that that person may not actually know how to do REIT analysis correctly and just move to the next person and see what's up. The correct metric is typically FFO um, or nay read FFO sometimes, but I want to show you what the calculation for FFO go is so that you can better understand why funds from operation is what you want to use. It's basically net income, which is the EPS line, but with all the shares totally outstanding, et cetera. And then you take out depreciation amortization, which is non-cash. I mean, this is the same as if you own a rental property or you own your own home. You're going to use depreciation and amortization to lower your tax bill, but it doesn't actually change how much cash you're getting. And then you have adjustments that are losses on the property or gains on the property. Remember that it's still the same as when you buy and sell your house. So if you did any fixtures or anything like that, that all goes in to make it look great so that you don't have this ridiculoso tax situation going on. And then there's interest income. Um, there's interest income as well. Um, and that can be a couple of different things. That can be changes in your interest rate because you you changed the structure of your debt. Maybe you refinance to get a different loan over a different period of time. For some of the REITs, it's also the case that they are investing in other real estate companies and they're just getting their share of that via an interest rate dividend. So in other words, they've lent to a property. So it can be this whole set of really intriguing things, but that's why we use funds from operations. And if you look at the FFO return that this company had, it was astronomical. It was really, really good. Here's the, um, here's the front page. You can find it in the quarterly report. Um, you know, um, I'm going to go through some of these other, but FFO was up almost 70%. Adjusted FFO, um, which uh, tries to take out the, which gives you the continuing operations versus the ones that are discontinued um, in this case, um, is about 51%. It was a stellar quarter. Now, some people like this, which is very similar to an FFO um, type of um, metric. It's EBITDA. I mean, it also incorporates a little bit of the rental, et cetera, um, CapEx, et cetera. But that's going to be still in the same range. But as you can see, this company crushed it. Now, the other metric I want to give you is RevPAR. So what is revenue RevPAR? The way that RevPAR attempts to give you a metric is because hotels, unlike here, let me actually move this. I keep forgetting that they put my face in exactly the wrong place to be very helpful. Um, here, I'll just move this over so you guys can see it. Okay, because rev, rev, what Revenue Par tries to do is it tries to give you a number on what they're charging per night, given that um, unlike an apartment where you're 
physically in that up all the time. Um, in a in in a hotel, some nights are let out, some lights are not let out, and then you have occupancy rates and things like that that you want to also look at. And um, what you see with RevPAR is you can see that they used to, so RevPAR and the associated numbers try to give you something that you can really do apples to apples. So RevPAR went from three two fifty. Per night is oftentimes how it's discussed, but there's a little bit of a trick to that, which I'll talk to you about. And then RevPAR um, here is now 325, which is a 30% increase. And to make sure that that's clear, revenue PAR can increase because they're charging more for the room per night. It can also increase because occupancy rate has improved. They're basically renting it out more nights out of the year. So you kind of get especially because we're coming out of this lull, this terrible period within travel in general, you get real um, earnings leverage. Like you really get it jumping up once the market starts to go back to a normal situation. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to go to the financial statements to show you, but the occupancy rates are still not 100%, but they are significantly, significantly improved. Um, I think there's around 70%. So if we continue to see really good um, rentals in the luxury market, then um, you can see that like this number could continue to amp up pretty aggressively. So um, those are kind of the key highlights um, there. I do want to show you how adjusted EBITDA is calculated here and you can kind of see. Um, so there are some equity invest investments. They're very small. That's why the difference between EBITDA and EBIT uh, Dar aren't that different. Um, there was a couple of properties that were unfortunately in the wake of the hurricane that hit Florida, but more or less the loss is very small because they, like any good hotel operator, actually had great insurance and that's taking care of the bulk of it. So um, you, you can always go into the document and get a cleaner understanding as you're growing your skill set. I know we've got some like pros that watch me, but we've got other folks that are still coming up the scale. So hopefully this is helpful as I walk through. And then let's see. Oh yeah. So here we go. This is the mix. So because these are um, operated and owned by host Marriott, or excuse me, by host. See, I already did it because I'm so used to calling this, this company a certain way. You can kind of see the operating profits and how that's amped up. And it's actually above 2019 at this point. That's a big deal. They will stop reporting earnings relative to 2019 as a result of that. So this is a fully recovered hotel. Um, and in general, I'm a huge fan of this because I have a little bit of a different sentiment than other folks do about what's going to happen. Now, right now, they're rocking about a 2.5% dividend yield. Um, but again, like I said, number one, they're well past any scenario where they're going to have a problem with the dividend yield uh, going forward. So, I And quite frankly, if they're doing these crazy like 30% plus returns on FFO and they're not trading anywhere near that, then this company is, I'm just going to say it, a really good value. <laughs> um, you know, look, the market could trade it up or down. It is what it is. But if we're talking about is this cheap? Yeah, it is cheap right this minute. Um, the market cap of this company, hold on, I should usually put the calculation on here, but I didn't this time. Um, I think it's trading about 10 times FFO, but let me let me just look at it. Um, if you if you go on to Yahoo Finance and you look at the um, EV to EBITDA calculation, it's always a little bit off because the debt is a little funky, but it's probably approximately right. It's trading about 11 times, um, but you're going to get really amped up um, earnings from that. But what you can do is just take the full year EBITDA number and divide it by market cap, and that'll give you what the numbers are for that Hopefully my screen isn't so small you can't see it. But um, but yeah, so so that's the good news of it. The bad news of it and the reason why I think it took a huge pause on the quarter, um, I'm still very bullish, but I, um, I was going to add potentially on this quarter, but I can't really add given what management said. So management is preparing for the worst, and I'm not sure why they're preparing for the worst. But let me show you their guidance if you compare their guidance to what they actually did this year, they're they're guiding flat, more or less. Okay, they're guiding. Here's their guidance. They did about um, so um, so. I just showed that uh, that average that room night. They're guiding a range 
range plus or minus around that rate, and then so on and so forth all the way down there. I mean, net income will look better because some of the below the line act, unless they buy another hotel or something like that, we're not expecting too much change. Look at their adjusted EBITDA. It's like 1.4 billion ish, you know, they're guiding like smack in the middle of all of that. And so if they come in at the high range, that's only a really small single digit growth, which is a little bit strange given that with inflation and if they actually get decent occupancy, which we're not really seeing a stoppage in occupancy right now, it doesn't totally make sense. Um, now, their issue is they think with the geopolitics and given that so many of the economists that they speak with are saying that this back half of the year is going to be a recession, that they are just being very extra cautious. Everybody can have their own opinion on that. So you kind of can decide whether they'll come in at the high end or the low end. But that's what they ended up reporting. I do want to mention the following, which is that these numbers, even though they don't necessarily have exposure to Europe and Asia, which is where more of the Chinese tourists tend to travel, um, that has really been a major driver for pretty much the entire travel industry, which reported crazy good numbers this quarter. Like most of them had greater than 20% revenue growth, with the exception of a couple of the regional airlines, okay? But most of the travel industry had top line growth greater than 20% and EPS growth that could that was like ridiculous, well over 30%, in some cases, 100%, something ludicrous like that across the board, across the board. It was insane. And if anything, the hotel business was doing significantly better than all the other pieces of the business. I mean, travel was so strong, everything for casinos, like if you look at their earnings numbers, crazy good to um, even cruise liners managed to eke it out in a very strong way. So this is a very surprising guidance. And the reason I think it's particularly surprising is because what they could have done is what a lot of companies did, which is just guide the next quarter and delay giving a full year guidance. So this is all exceptionally strange, in my opinion. Let me see if there's any other um, little anecdotals that I wanted to provide from the quarter. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And David has joined me on the call. Hey, David. Um, I don't know if you are looking at Host Mary at all, at all or some of your friends are because I know you, you've got friends that do real estate and all kinds of stuff. Um, any thoughts or any questions on this one? No, you? no. I, I, I like the business model. Excuse me. Yeah. I mean, if you look at I, I think it's a pretty straightforward one. Um, definitely, if this is something that you guys have on your radar screen, watch it. It seems to be more or less range bound around that $17 level right now, $17, $17.50. But because it has that dividend and because like legitimately they bought these properties for very cheap, like you know, strangely enough, if you guys ever go to Jackson Hole, Jackson, Wyoming, um, I've only been there once, but definitely everybody does their appraised ski at that Four Seasons. But like, if you've ever been, um, there's really a limited number of rooms there. And if anything, they will charge more, not less for that property, because for like a huge component of that room of that place when they bought it was under renovation. They ran out of renovation money. That's why they were able to get it for so cheap. And then the other properties go down the list and you could just periodically, if you're a hardcore um, value investor, just periodically call them or check you know, the the various websites for what the pricing is for the hotel rates. But hotel rates are not going down. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the fact that labor cost is increasing. Now, these guys are going to go to full service and they have been able to get away with partial full service. They have all kinds of different things that they've been doing, like allowing you when you check in to determine whether or not you want your room cleaned every day. They think that that is going to mediate a bit and have baked that in. So that's also part of the reason why they guided the way they did. But I think that I think people are not necessarily wanting people in their room all the time. I really don't know a better way to say it. So I, I actually think that might be okay. Um, you say that you, you're saying Four Seasons ran out of uh, construction money. That's how they bought it. Yeah, they that that was definitely a distressed purchase because they had started these renovations on that particular property um, right before COVID. And then they were fixing it up during COVID to take advantage of the fact that people weren't there. But then if you think about it, um, material costs got out of control. And so they basically oh. needed the. Yeah. 
so they needed to to move on with that property now it's interesting because they really did not discuss any other property purchases to come on this particular call that wasn't the thrust of the the main points of what they said on the earnings call and i but i was really disappointed because despite all that they were really cautious on the call like a lot of people pushed them why are you so conservative you literally are are suggesting you're going to have like more or less a flat year across every quarter and that's despite the fact that you're saying that you have decent bookings for the first few quarters and they were like we really don't know what to do given our economists are saying there's going to be a recession so this one really comes down to if you're an investor, you're going to have to make a call. Do you think there's a recession or not in the second half of the year? And also, by the way, do you think that recession will affect the wealthiest of wealthy? These are not your average room. These are not business. I mean, they're not. not Four business. seasons. No. Four seasons yeah. is higher. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, right. some of their properties are, okay, in fairness, if you go down the list here, um, you'll see that some of them, like they own Copley Place in in Boston. I mean, you might have, there, there are definitely properties where they do benefit from the conference, from conferences coming back. So, you know, but then they've, but still, those are like, those are, a, in general, it's a very particular type of business traveler, and it's a very particular type of property. So, um all of that are they in vegas at all i think they are let me just take a look here i'm gonna shoot a, i'm gonna share the screen and go back to the properties so we can investigate because i really do think some of these are fun um to look at and dream about <laughs> in some ways um and i know you've traveled all over so you know big sir uh because you're um yeah so these are the properties i'll go a little bit on the slow side they own a few in hawaii um a few in san fran they own a bunch of really high-end places in Florida. Um, and uh, yeah, so in Vegas, I don't remember seeing one for sure, but it might be the case. Yeah. Well, I'm, ask, I, I, I'm asking from a casino standpoint. Oh, um, I don't know is the answer to that question. Okay. I'm still learning um, and rising some of their more fun properties that I personally would like to go to. So that might be the, that might be the reason why I'm off on it. Uh, but yeah, here we'll scroll through. We're almost done. I know this is a really fast scroll, but um, yeah, I don't see one for Vegas. And that might just be because the Vegas tell buyers, there's just a lot of aggressiveness in that market. Right, right. You know, say that the Vegas hotels um, business was, was great this quarter. I think if anything, yeah, um, travel was really good. Travel was, was really good to Vegas. Caesars did well. They posted an amazing. Travel's good everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a strange thing right now. Um, Call it revenge yeah, travel. Amazing. I love Duke, and he's like adding all these great. Um, yep, that's right. Look, that's awesome. All of these uh, little fun facts here. Um, so yeah, travel's doing really great. This is probably given the two and a half percent dividend yield. If you find a good place to get it, because it does swing a bit. I mean, it's traded slightly below 17, but it's found pretty good support there. Will it continue to do that? I don't know the answer to that, but I would say that um, if you get an economic recovery, look through the properties and see what you think but the balance sheet looks pretty clean and they will probably be acquisitive if we do truly have a recession where they would end up being acquisitive wasn't something that was talked about here but um yeah i you know that's really it in a nutshell any other questions how long have they been doing this um, they spun out of host Marriott in 1993. So oh. it was a bit of a transformation from 93 until I want to say like really it was early 2000s period. I want to say 2002, if I remember correctly, but it's on their website. They have a great timeline on their website. So you don't have to uh, take my word for it at all. Um, but it's, it's early 2000s period where they started to move towards luxury hotels. And then the rest has been kind of history. There were a couple of weird years, particularly they took it on the chin like everybody else in 2008. And I think that's why they've been so good about capitalizing themselves a particular way. But they really yeah. are. If you want a hotel read exposure, this is really your best bet. There may be some very small guys out there that also do this. But within the S&P 500, this is the, this is the major hotel read. Yeah, I had some friends in uh, Texas, in Dallas, actually. They uh, they own like Hotel Bel Air. They own a hotel in uh, oh, nice. Maui, the mansion on Turtle Creek. And I mean, 
there is really good money in this if you get the right ones. If you get the right properties and you manage them correctly, there it's it's pretty. I mean, especially if we're it, okay. It really depends on your economic view, specifically the luxury piece of the economic view. But you know, so far everything in travel has been taking um, has like you know where spending is going has been travel that was consistent across all of the travel related companies and also the credit card companies that often give you color on how the travel industry is going. That's where people are deploying their excess capital, so to speak, is experiential. Okay. Really big, one, good support, which is awesome. I didn't see any real questions. One person said Jackson Hole for approximately, approximately 315 million. All uh, cash is pretty, pretty epic in my opinion. <laughs> Well, how much how much of a deal is that? I guess that's what my question is. It ends up being, um, I think. Oh, I think usually these hotels go for fifteen times EBITDA, but this one went for I want to say under ten or right at ten or something like that. Oh, so it was okay. it was a really nice it was a really nice uptick. It might have gone for even less than that, but um, they believe that they can increase rates on the room on the rooms pretty aggressively. Sorry, guys. I don't know for sure uh, the answer to that. I'll have to look back in my notes on that. Yeah, well, I plan on going to Jackson Hole, so I will certainly go to this one. You good? Do some due diligence for us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. Um, that's it. it. Any other questions? I don't think I see any, so we'll kind of call it off there because there's still a lot going on in these markets. Good luck, everybody. Take care. Bye.